Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you. Um, as Scott said, uh, I'm uh, Wolfgang. I work here and excited. You know, I've gotten to sort of sit and be on the receiving end through this whole Childish Things series. I've been so challenged by it. I'm very excited now to get to be a part to a chance to contribute kind of to the conversation, but so glad that you're here, especially if you're here um, for the first time. Those of you online, of course, we're thrilled to have you with us um, as well. But, um, you know, in this series, uh, Scott sort of uh, reminded us this as we kicked off each of these talks, is this sort of tagline, this little summary of what it is we've been challenging each other with over these last several weeks, and it's simply this. Everyone gets older, right? Like, that's unavoidable. Everyone gets older, but not everyone grows up. And so we've been challenging and sort of daring each other to mature, to grow up spiritually speaking. Because here's the truth, maybe you like me, I've met some 50-year-olds that are just little boys and girls. They're just big and gray. (laughs) And I've met some 15-year-olds who are spiritual women, spiritual men, it has very little to do with your chronological age. What about you? Now, if you were here last week, you might remember that Scott talked about his significant romantic prowess as a fourth grader. Some of you were here for that, may, you may remember. Those of you who weren't, basically Scott told us about an, an effort that he made to try to impress his older friend, and in doing trying to impress him, he lied about having a girlfriend that they could never meet because she lived in another state. Do you remember which state she lived in? Oklahoma, isn't it amazing the stuff that people remember out of a talk, right? I could ask you what the rest of the talk was about. She's like, I'm not sure, but she was from Oklahoma. Oh, yeah, that's where he said. That's what he said. That's just the way it works. We've resigned ourselves to that years ago, but anyway. And incidentally, Scotty, having grown up in Arkansas, any girlfriend north of there is an upgrade, right? So uh, anyway, (laughs) I can see why he fantasized that, but uh, anyhow. He wasn't the only one who had a few stumbles in the romantic learning process growing up. I remember when I was 14 years old, I uh, had gone to a church camp like I did every summer growing up in western Pennsylvania. And just a little quick side note, um, those of you who have middle schoolers or high schoolers in your world, our winter retreats, our winter camps are coming up for them, which are a fantastic environment to just kind of challenge students to be thinking about these big questions. So if you've got those, uh, you've got students in your life like that, there's details about that uh, in the program, of course, on the website. But anyway, this was not a winter camp I was at. As a 14-year-old, I was at a summer camp, and I will never forget it. Because at that camp, I met a girl. Now, I had met girls before, but this girl was unlike any I had ever met previously. And within eight hours of meeting that girl, I was convinced I'm going to marry that girl. Did you have like one of those teenage crush things happen in your life? I'm going to marry her. In fact, that night when we were in the cabin talking about girls in camp, which of course is what guys do at church camp at night in the cabins, right? I even told my friend Gary that first night, laying there in our bunks, I said, uh, you know, I'm going to marry that girl. Now, she hadn't noticed me, of course, which is the story of my romantic life, but over the course of that week, I made it a goal to try to get to know her. I eventually sort of worked my way closer. I got her phone number. The week after camp, I finally mustered up the courage to call her, and in one of our very first phone conversations... I told her in my still-changing mid-puberty voice, I said, if I was old enough, I would marry you right now, I said. Now, single guys, I do not recommend this approach, okay? (laughs) Telling someone you're going to marry them in your first few conversations more alarming than attractive, okay? It's a great path toward getting a restraining order slapped on you, all right? That's... But as a 14-year-old, I was a raging cocktail of hormones and impulsiveness and overconfidence, and did I mention hormones? I was convinced that she was the one, and I was ready to commit. Now, a little side note for those of you who are wondering kind of how the story worked out. I didn't marry that girl at 14. We waited seven years, and then we got married. Um, And now, almost 23 years later, I'm pretty happy about that, right? That's a pretty good thing. Now, I'm not, yeah, thanks, appreciate that. I'm not sure if she'd clap for that, but she'd at least, uh, she at least held on through the process. And incidentally, my friend Gary that was in the cabin with me, that he spoke at our wedding and told that story, uh, which was sort of fun. Now, could I have known as a 14-year-old what all was involved in a commitment like that? Of course not, right? 
Did I have any idea then, seven years later, when we slipped those rings on, any idea of the scope of the commitment that we were making? Absolutely not, right? Because that's kind of what happens with big commitments. But again, let me say, this is not the template on how to make thoughtful, significant commitments in your life. A few hours might be enough to make plans for the weekend, but it's typically not enough to make decisions about who you're going to marry, where you want to do with your life, what the eternal trajectory, trajectory of your, his, your future may be, any of those sorts of things. Because I had a lot of growing up to do when it came to impulsiveness, when it came to boundaries and things like that. But even though I didn't understand all that that commitment might mean, I was more than ready to jump in. And we all know that is not normal, not in our society. Now, there are some people who are too quick to make commitments. They get caught up in whatever comes their way, and maybe some folks wrestle with that form of childish things in their life. Some people, sometimes people do this spiritually. They get all excited about what's happening spiritually in their lives, and they sign up for everything they can find. This sometimes happens at North Shore. People get all excited, and they think spiritual life equals activity. And so they pack their calendars with every class they can find, multiple small groups. They volunteer in 27 ministries. They're all over the place, right? It's actually a fairly common thing for people who become followers of Jesus. And let me say, if you're in that place or you're feeling that impulse, I mean, maybe some of you brand new to all this and you think, boy, what I need to do is just get on this place or with these people as often as I possibly can in five different ministries. Let me remind you, the spiritual life is not a sprint It's a marathon, okay? Here's what I mean. I've seen a lot of people who come out of the gates fast. They are on fire, but they sort of burn out quickly because they make a bunch of commitments that they can't sustain. And when they start to feel overwhelmed, rather than admitting that they got carried away and sort of scaling back their activity, well, you know what they tend to do, what I've seen many, many times? They give up. They just sort of disappear. You don't see them anymore around here. Maybe it's because they're embarrassed that they didn't follow through. Maybe they feel like they just don't have what it takes, so they'll go check something else out. But either way, what happens is this sort of spiritual flash in the pan. And as a result, down the road, they're hesitant to make any commitments like that again. And maybe some of you, that's your spiritual story. Maybe you're wrestling with that danger right now. That's what I want to talk about today. This question of commitment. Because we live in a commitment phobic, keep your options open, what's your return policy kind of world, don't we? Just the word commitment scares some people. It's partly because we want to keep our options open. Who doesn't like options? I don't want to commit to this invitation. Some people will say, why? Maybe something better will come along. For those in school, I'm not sure I want to go to the dance with you. What if somebody better asks me? I might get a better offer. Maybe you're single. I don't know if I want to go out with you. Somebody better might come along. I don't know about that job, you might say. Maybe there's a better opportunity for me. And marriage? Ah, I mean, you're great. But what if someone better is out there? See, a child says, I always want to keep my options open. Growing up, means making certain commitments. And the same spirit sometimes creeps into our spiritual lives. Do you want to commit to God? I don't know. Maybe. Do you want to commit to a lifestyle of generosity? Do you want to go public with your faith by being baptized? Do you want to become a member of the church or commit to an actual community and become part of that. I don't know. I don't know. What if, what if I promise to follow God today, but tomorrow I don't feel like following God? What if I commit to this church and then one of the teaching pastors gives a lousy message, right? Because it happens. It happens. Hopefully not today. <laughs> so we keep our options open. We're in, but we're not all in. And when things get challenging in the marriage, or when we're not happy with our job, or we don't feel that same thrill that we once felt, spiritually speaking, we look for the exits. It's one of the main reasons so many people stay so stuck spiritually. There are people who have followed Jesus for 10 years, and then there are people who have followed Jesus for one year 10 times. Do you know what I mean? 
Because that's how long the cycle sometimes takes. Something stirs in them. They, they run into a crisis, or they need God's help, or they become aware of their need for God's grace, some guilt or something from a mistake they've made, and they get very excited by this newfound faith. But once the crisis passes, and once the excitement isn't what it once was, once the grace doesn't seem quite as amazing as it used to be, they sort of fade away. Until, of course, something else happens. And they repeat the cycle all over again. The truth is, there are lots of people who have been at this for a long time, but have actually only had the same one, two, or three-year experience over and over and over again. But you see, to actually grow, to actually mature, takes commitment. It learns. It means learning to hang on through those dry spells, to keep going when we feel like giving up. It's holding on, sometimes even feels like pushing through that allows us to actually begin to reach deeper levels of growth and faith and maturity, to grow up instead of just growing old. And the good stuff, the richness of knowing that God can be trusted, knowing that his love is more powerful than anything else in this world, knowing you can count on him no matter how dark it is, that only comes when you've held on even through the hard parts. See, it's one of these cornerstone verses of this entire series. The writer of Hebrews is teaching these early Christians about this. He's challenging people to go deeper. And listen to what he says in Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 11. He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. See, be really clear, this is not a try harder message, okay? This is not a pull up your bootstraps, you're not working hard enough message. That's not what this is. This is not about trying harder at all. It's about training ourselves in the way of life that Jesus makes possible. In fact, after our Loving Monday series about how work and faith interact that Scott referenced earlier, after we finish that series, in mid-March we're starting a new series called How to Change Your Life Without Trying. It's talking about some of these habits that people have used for thousands of years to grow deeper in their relationship and connection with God, to mature their relationship. That's some of the very same habits that Jesus himself used in his life. Because you see, contrary to popular belief, following Jesus is not a one-time decision. Following Jesus is a daily decision to continue to grow. But it starts with a decision, a commitment. It starts there. There's a little-known story that I want to point to that helps us understand this maybe in a fresh way. It's a passage and story that many people aren't even familiar with. In fact, it's just three little verses in the middle of an Old Testament book called First Kings, part of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament as we call it. If you have a Bible, you may want to turn there. First Kings chapter 19. And I know for a lot of folks that's not an area you spend a lot of time in, so I'll give you a little extra time to find it, all right? First Kings chapter 19. Incidentally, if you don't have a Bible, of course it'll be on the screen. You can always download a great Bible app to your phone, but We have copies, physical copies of the scriptures as well, that after the service, if you want to come over and ask for one, I'll give you one. I'd love to even show you how to start reading in a bit. But anyway, 1 Kings 19. And I heard a message on this little story that for a long time I just overlooked. I heard a message on this from, of all people, John Ortberg, who is going to be our guest speaker next week. And just a quick side note, don't come next week. Come with someone next week, all right? Bring someone with you. I'll tell you why, and I'm no exaggeration, I think he is my favorite Christian teacher alive right now, I'll just tell you. Over 20 years ago, I heard him speak for the first time, and uh, he was at a church in Chicago, and I have followed his teaching and ministry ever since. For years, I subscribed to his messages, all right, which in those ancient days, before podcasts and YouTube videos 
and indoor plumbing. Uh, every week, every week I would get a little package in the mail that contained a purple audio cassette. Audio cassettes are these little recording devices you can find in museums sometimes. Every week, one of my highlights was taking that tape, sticking it in the tape player, and listening to his talk. I still have some of those old tapes. Now, I don't have anything I can play them on, but I still have some of those tapes. I just can't part with them. Anyway, I heard John talk about this passage uh, some time ago, and what he had to say, the insights were so helpful that they bled into this talk as well, of course. Now, the story is in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. Three little verses. The story is one of a prophet named Elijah who is nearing the end of his ministry, and he's looking for his replacement. So here's what it says, 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Verse 21, so Elisha left him and went back. Stop there for a second. The names, obviously, are very similar in this story, so it's easy to get them mixed up. Elijah is an old man. He's the one looking for his replacement. And he comes to the field where this farmer is plowing his land. His name is Elisha. And it appears he has 11 employees who are guiding 11 pairs of oxen. And the farmer himself is actually plowing with the last team named Elisha. And in this very dramatic moment, it's easy to miss the drama of this. In this very dramatic moment, Elijah goes up to Elisha, he takes off his cloak and puts it on Elisha's shoulders. Other translations, instead of calling it a cloak, call it a mantle. Maybe you've heard that before, not the shelf by your fireplace, but have you ever heard the old saying, they're passing on the mantle? That's where this, this story is where that comes from. Because the cloak or the mantle was a symbol of the prophet's role, his authority, his job. It's like his uniform, you might say. And by putting this cloak or mantle on Elisha, Elijah is saying, you're the guy. I want you to take over my role, my position. And there's another thing about this story that actually makes it as powerful as it is that we will very easily miss. Think about this. Elisha has 12 teams of oxen all out plowing his fields at one time, which means he has a huge farm. It means he's wealthy enough to have a large herd of livestock at his estate, which all means Elisha is loaded, all right? Which also means Elisha has options. Frankly, he had so much money, he probably doesn't even have to be out there working. He probably has the pick of the village as to who he'll marry. He could easily just sit back, live out his days, overseeing his estate in comfort and peace. I mean, Elisha has the life most people dream about in our world. Leave all that to take over the work of some penniless preacher who spent much of his life on the run from powerful people trying to kill him, Elijah, because they don't like what God's telling them through him? Why in the world would anyone want to do that? Dude, you're set. Surely there are better opportunities out there, better offers for you. Keep your options open. But you notice Elisha's response. He has one request. He says, let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I'll come to you, which seems very fair. But Elijah's response, it sounds a little grumpy at first look. Go ahead, he says. What have I done to you? And I don't think he's saying, what's your problem, man? I think what he's saying is, I'm not forcing you to do anything. You're not obligated, but you've got to decide. Because maybe you'll go home to mommy and daddy, and they'll remind you of that trust fund. They'll remind you of that cabin that you have in the mountains. And you'll bail because you don't want to walk away from that. You won't come back. Because I'm not going to force you, basically. But here's the key. 
Elijah gives Elisha the space to make the commitment for himself. No pressure, no guilt, no manipulation. You have to decide. And that is just as true for us when it comes to spiritual stuff. No one can make these decisions or commitments for you. Not your spouse, not your kids, not your friend, not your parents, not your pastor, only you. And that's why here at North Shore, you will not get these super guilt-heavy talks, these super emotional, high-pressure, get everybody all lathered up, tug on your heartstring moments where people try to manipulate you into making decisions that ultimately won't last. We simply put it out there. There is a God who knows and loves you and wants to give you a fresh start no matter what you've done or where you've been. New beginning. And he wants to help you learn to live the kind of life that Jesus lived. This faith-filled, joy-drenched, peace-saturated life. Just like Jesus. But to experience it, you have to decide for yourself. These kinds of commitments are only made for oneself. And that's exactly what Elisha does. Elisha decides to say yes to God. He comes back to Elijah and he says, I'm ready to go, but there's just one more thing I have to do. This is fantastic. Look at this. Second half of verse 21 in 1 Kings 19. He says, he, Elisha, took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. They ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. He burns the plow. See what's happening here? He comes back to Elijah and he says, I'm in. In fact, to demonstrate that I'm in, here's what I'm going to do. He kills the two oxen that he had just been farming with a moment ago. And he prepares them as a sort of sacrifice. In some ways, these oxen represent the idea that Elisha is offering his life as a sacrifice to God. But of course, this is more than just a sacrifice. It's also a celebration. Because when people actually go all in with God, that's worth celebrating. And so he throws a massive party. Think about this for a second. He shares the meat with the people. Do you have any idea how many people you can feed with two full-size oxen? Can you imagine? We hear like a side of beef and a family can eat off that for a year, you know? Two full oxen. What a party. What a party. But you think about this. Elisha does one of the best things you can do when you make an important commitment. He goes public. When people ask, hey, what's with the party? They hear the story that Elisha has said yes to God. And he goes public in a very, very big way. That's part of why baptism is so important. Yes, as Scott talked about last week, Jesus himself was baptized. And if there's nothing else that happens, that's good enough reason for us to do it too. And yes, Jesus directly commands those who follow him to be baptized. And even if just being obedient to Jesus is reason to be baptized. That's good enough. But in addition to all of that, one of the other things that's so powerful about baptism is it takes this commitment that we make to follow Jesus and it goes public. There's real power in that. Elisha goes public with his decision to say yes to God. So not only does he kiss his family goodbye and kill his oxen and throw a party at this very public celebration, he does one more thing. You caught it? He burns the plow. What does that mean? He's saying there is no turning back. I cannot go back to my old life. It's not even an option anymore. I burned the plow. And down the road, when his mentor eventually leaves him and Elisha is on his own, he remembers, I can't go back. I burned the plow. And when things get hard in Elisha's story, which they get very hard, you can keep reading. The king wants to kill him. Enemy armies surround and threaten him. He nearly dies of starvation in one story. His own people ignore and reject him. He says, as hard as it gets, but I can't go back. I can't retreat. I've already made my decision. I am committed. I burned the plow. Some of you, you've heard a story like this before, haven't you? Not 
the Jesus story. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a couple centuries after this, 1519. The explorer, Hernan Cortez, remember the story? He lands in Veracruz, Mexico, pursuing glory for himself in the new world. He sailed from Spain with 500 soldiers and 100 sailors spread out over 11 ships. And when they land, the members of their group were afraid, not sure what exactly to expect once they got on the beachhead. And some of them wanted to go back. And the story goes that Cortez ordered the men to burn the ships. In other words, there is no going back. We're committed. We will succeed or we will die, but we will not turn back. So burn the ships. You've probably heard that. I've, I've heard it in motivational talks. I've heard it in sermons. I've read it in several business books. And if you do a little bit of research, you discover it's not entirely accurate, okay? Just let's be honest. For instance, they didn't actually burn the ships. It's kind of a minor detail. <laughs> they ran them aground. They scuttled them. Because why in the world would you waste that great lumber that you could use for shelter, which is exactly what they did? Tore the ships apart, build shelters out of them. And they didn't actually destroy them all. They left one. Because their plan, of course, was to take all that treasure for themselves back to Spain. And maybe a few leaders if things got hairy, right? Who knows? And let's be honest, it's kind of the dark side of the story. Cortez wasn't exactly nice to the Aztecs that he met in the New World. And I think it's important for us to mention some of these less exciting elements of the story, shall we say. Because this isn't just about glorifying commitment, you see. There are people who are deeply committed to things that are not worthy of their commitment. Things that are, people that are deeply committed to things that wind up doing a whole lot of damage. For example, if a football player or team has an overpowering commitment to win the Super Bowl, and they cheat to do it, by, say, deflating footballs, <laughs> or spying on the other team's practices, or interfering with opponent communications on the sidelines, or coincidentally having a fire alarm go off in the Philadelphia Eagles hotel the night before the Super Bowl last year. Did you know that happened? Mysterious. And then, of course, perhaps benefiting from obvious pass interference penalties that are mysteriously uncalled. That is not a good thing, right? That was actually the Rams, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's okay. <laughs> Not that anyone would do anything like that, right? Only the patriots could take our divided nation and bring us all together, can't they? It's amazing. <laughs> we are united as no one else has been able to unite us. We're trying with Jesus, but so far, hatred for the patriots far more effective in the short term. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> Seriously. Kick it over a notch, just a bit more serious. When someone has a rock-hard commitment to succeed in their career, but a jello, squishy commitment to their marriage or their family, it's a bad thing. It's actually idolatry, to use the Bible word. Because idolatry simply means ultimate commitment to non-ultimate things. That's what idolatry is. Ultimate commitment to non-ultimate things. This isn't just growing up and making commitments and sticking with it. It's growing up and making the right commitments to the right things, things that matter, really. Because some in this room are deeply committed in pursuit of the life that Elisha left. Life of comfort, luxury, abundance. I mean, all those oxen, all those fields. Come on, man, why would you walk away? That's what everybody wants. Now, there's nothing wrong with having things. We say this all the time. But God's calling you to something deeper than that. Something of eternal significance. Instead of being so committed to figuring out how to get, get and have and keep more and more and more. Focusing on how to use what we have to be a blessing to this world around us. Because when ordinary people like you and me say, I will be a passionate follower of Jesus. I am not content to stumble through life like some kind of spiritual toddler. I will not make childish excuses or blame others for my shortcomings. 
I will not whine about how I'm not getting what I deserve in life. I will not build my life trying to win the approval of other people so I can feel better about myself. I am committed to grow up, to get serious about this, to do more than go through the motions. When ordinary people like you and me actually decide to do that, amazing things start to take place. Even more, when a whole group of people, when they make a commitment to respond to the calling of God, to be a place where people are really discovering that God can change everything for anyone. Why? Because they themselves are being changed. Where a group of people commit to being a place where we're challenging each other, leading each other into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. When a group of people commit to being for their neighbors and for the next generation and for the people in need in our area and beyond so that all people can benefit, can flourish. When people commit to a cause like that, and they say, no matter the cost, no matter what, I am not going back. I have barbecued the ox. I have walked away from the trust fund. The ships are smoldering in the harbor. I have burned the plow. When that happens, something world-changing takes place. Don't believe me? Check out the New Testament book of Acts. You'll see it in action. So let me just ask you, you, not the person beside you, the one you think, oh, they should have come today. You. What plow do you need to burn? What have you been holding back that's actually been holding you back? Where is it time to go all in? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe the thrill isn't what it once was. And you find yourself tempted to escape or give up or see what else might be out there. The secret to a healthy marriage isn't some magical power that certain people have and others don't. You talk to people who've been married for decade after decade after decade in thriving, flourishing marriages, they'll tell you it is a thousand little commitments powered by God. It's saying, I'll listen, I'll give. I don't always have to be right. I'll admit when I'm wrong. I won't go flirting online or at work. I won't try to escape through a bottle or a screen or a shopping spree. I make a promise. For better or worse, for richer or poor, in sickness and health, I have burned the plow. Or maybe it's your family. Rock solid commitment at work. Jello squishy commitment at home. It's keeping promises instead of making excuses for them. Maybe it's around here. You know, I like coming to services. I like that Scotty guy, that Wolfgang's good looking. I come, I like it, I like it. (laughs) But I don't want to commit to this. I don't want to join a small group. Who has time? Volunteer to serve? Seem like they're covering it fine without me. Maybe, like Elisha, God's calling you to make your life an act of service to him. Maybe in some dramatic way. Who knows? You say, I like this place, but I don't want to give. Not in any meaningful or intentional way, just if I have a little spare in my pocket. Oh, this is all interesting, but who has time to actually study this word? There there are so many binge-watching shows to enjoy, right? Right? Of course I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to be baptized. Come on, man. I don't want to get in front of all those people and get my hair wet. Are you kidding me? I got an image to uphold, right? So I'm in, but I'm not all in. There's a mentor of mine. He used to have this saying. He'd say, 95% commitment is what? He'd say. And the answer back, it's 5% short. 95% commitment, it's 5% short. Yeah, but that's an A. It is. But 95% 95 commitment, it's 5% short. So what's in your 5%? What are you holding back in your heart, in your life? You want to grow up? Give it. 100%. Now, 
Some of you are here, you're saying, earlier you said, this isn't one of those guilt places. Try to make me feel bad so I'll do something different. That's not what I'm trying to do. Because maybe you hear this and you feel inside, you know, my, I wouldn't give myself 90, 95%, frankly. I'll admit it. You got me, Wolfgang. I am an inadequate commitment keeper. I've blown a lot of promises in my life. And to you I say, so have I. Perhaps more than even you. We all wrestle with that. And when I blow it, when we all blow it, the key is remembering at the heart of this entire thing is this amazing thing called grace. That our God is a commitment-keeping God. And when we fail, when we fall down, when we do not keep our commitments to Him, you know what? He still keeps His commitments to us. In fact, all the more in the cross of Jesus. You see, the big commitment, the ultimate commitment a human being can make, the one that is worth your life and death, full 100% in, is the commitment to love and follow this Jesus who is infinitely committed to you. And if you're here this weekend or you're watching online and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're just exploring what all this is about, we're thrilled you're here. We want you to feel welcome. But I hope you'll consider this. I hope you'll think about the role of commitment and commitment to Jesus above all in human life. I hope you'll join us for this environment we have to wrestle with these kinds of questions in a conversation, not a lecture, called Alpha. It's this Thursday night at 6.30. We have dinner, we watch a video, we talk about these big questions. I'll be there, I'd love to see you there. Now some of you made that decision last week. Maybe you even slipped up your hand when Scott challenged us to do this, but after you slipped up your hand, you slipped out the back. And maybe you didn't have a chance to tell anybody. I'd love to talk with and pray with you after this service. I'm going to be hanging out right over here in the corner. I'd love to see you. Maybe you made that commitment a long time ago, but you've never gone public by being baptized. There's been excuses. There have been reasons. It's time. No more keeping your options open. It is time to take the plunge, literally, all right? I'd love to talk to you about that. You can find out more about it on our website. If you're part of our church, though, if you're a follower of Jesus, I hope, I pray, I hope so deeply that we will be the kind of church that our mouths water when it comes to being challenged, to total outrageous commitment to Jesus, to be a community of people who don't just come to hear God loves you just the way they are, but then walk out of this place rarely think about God and live however we want until we come back the following week to be told again God loves you no matter what. Can I tell you? He loves you no matter what. But I hope it would be the kind of place where we love to be called to ever-deepening, outrageous commitment to Jesus. Not because we're better than anybody else or more disciplined than anybody else, just for one reason. Because when Jesus came, He gave 100%. Jesus did not give 95. He gave all he had, all he was. I heard somebody say this one time, Jesus himself is so humble that if there is a better way than this that came along, Jesus would be the first one to say, take it, right? But there is not a better one coming, friends. Life as a follower of Jesus is what human life was meant to be. So let me ask you, what's holding you back from that? What plow do you need to burn? Because when Jesus came, he didn't hedge his bets. He didn't jettison out of here when things got tough. He remained committed to his calling, to his mission. He went all in with no guarantee we'd respond, with no escape clause or return policy. He willingly laid himself down as a sacrifice that we needed so we could have new life. And instead of offering an ox on a wooden plow, instead he offered himself on a wooden cross. That's what he did for us. And that's what we remember when we take what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. We remember how Jesus committed himself to bringing new life to people like you and me so that every broken commitment, every time we fall short, every one of us could have another chance, a new life. His commitment made that possible. And it wasn't a 95% commitment. It was all in. 
So would you bow your head with me as we get ready to eat this meal together? These symbols that represent his body in the form of this bread, his blood in the form of the cup of the juice. And if you've got questions about that, there's a little section on the program you can read a bit more. But God, I thank you. I thank you that you did not hold anything back. You gave us your best. And not just most of him, all of him. I thank you for your commitment to us, Father. And there are some in this room, today is the day they need to make a decision. Today. It's commitment time. It is time to go all in. Maybe even some who others look at as spiritual giants secretly know there's some percentage they've been holding back. But no matter where we're at, to begin by just admitting our need for him. Anything short of 100, Lord, we just admit it. We've been, we've been short. We need you. We believe that you are who you said you were. You are the promised one, the rescuer, the healer, the savior, the one that we need. And we confess, not only are you just the savior, you're my savior. Because I'm in, Jesus. And I'm still going to stumble, I'm still going to fall, but I thank you for grace that helps me get back up to try again, to train again, to learn again, to grow again, to keep going. I want to follow you. And some of you, you need to express that decision by being baptized. It's time to go public. These secret little prayers, quite frankly, that's nowhere in the Bible. All we see is public expression of this decision. And if you've not done that, you need to. No more excuses. So God, I stand before you and I admit that my percentage wanes, goes up and down. And sometimes I marvel at your patience and your grace, sometimes nothing. I always marvel at your patience and your grace. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the power that fuels this quest to live as you lived. Teach us, form us, mold us. Make us a community of people who are all in so that this world can see you are who you said you were and can discover the joy that many of us have found. So as we eat these symbols, we're reminded of that level of commitment you made to us, the bread and juice. But you can eat as it goes by. Just go ahead and eat it when you're ready. We thank you. We thank you. Because it's time to put childish things behind us. It's time to grow up. It's time to burn the plow. In your name, 